This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm joined in studio by our friend Alan Mendenhall. I'm sure many of you know him. He's an attorney and dean of a law school here in the state of Alabama, and he's also our residential legal expert uh, when it comes to the Mises Institute analyzing court cases, and in this instance, Supreme Court justices. So we're talking about newly appointed Brett Kavanaugh as our subject this week. And, you know, Alan, I'm, I'm looking at this guy, and first and foremost, it's so untrump like because I, I read somewhere, some commenter said, this is a guy that, that a President Rubio or a President Ted Cruz easily could have appointed. This is a swamp guy. He, he was probably the, the swampiest of the swamp critters. Yeah. Of the of the possible nominees, um, he was he was my least favorite of the four uh, that they were down okay. to. We were down to Barrett and Kethledge and Hardiman and uh, and Kavanaugh was probably my least favorite. Um, and uh, so I, I sort of agree with Judge Napolitano. He came out with an op-ed yesterday saying he was disappointed in the pick, and I, I have my reasons for that too. Um, I do think that had uh, had Roy Moore not lost the election to Doug Jones and mm-hmm. the Republicans hadn't lost that seat. And John McCain, if he didn't have cancer and you had you had those two seats, it probably would have been a different choice. You probably would have seen Trump pick someone with a little bit uh, stronger conservative bona fides, for okay. lack of a better a better, better word. But I think you know concerns about Susan Collins from Maine and uh, Lisa Markowski and how they might they might split um, right. might might defect made this choice more moderate, um, more palatable to people on the left. Um, so he's he's definitely the safest pick of those four. Well, the other thing about the swamp is this guy literally grew up in D.C. And that seems to me a, a very bad omen for people who think like we do. You know, I'm thinking out loud of, of, of other people who have grown up in D.C. Al Gore, uh, Pat Buchanan actually grew up in D.C. Yep. Uh, the sports writer John Feinstein yeah. Grew up in D.C. And I think it's a very odd place to grow up. I think, you know, this whole brouhaha over his Nationals tickets. I think it, it gives you a hometown <laughs> sense of a place. It isn't really a hometown. It's not a, it's not a real place. It's, it's a, a false place. Yeah, it's a transient community. And uh, so, yeah, you're right. And uh, in his his career was basically in D.C. from the time that he was uh, – you know, before he was associate counsel and uh, senior associate counsel in the mm-hmm. White House and an assistant to W. Bush and and all that kind of stuff. You know, he had clerked for Kennedy. He clerked for Kaczynski, which I see as being interesting. I don't see Kaczynski as being your sort of standard cookie cutter establishment type. But right. uh, but you know, working in the uh, office of independent counsel, Ken Starr, doing working on the Starr report, uh, working on the Vince Foster investigation. Um, there's a reason why it looked as though this guy is everywhere. You know, he's he's in the Bush administration when Katrina happens. He's there, mm-hmm. you know, when Rehnquist dies. He's he's there um, at the Star Report, all this Clinton stuff. And that's why he had such a tough time getting uh, getting confirmed when he was first nominated back in, in 2003. It took him three years to get confirmed to the D.C. Well, circuit. Why so. is Trump, of all people, nominating a Bushy? I mean, it's, it's a surprise. Unbelievable. It's a surprise. I think – I think that he had a lot of people advising him about confirmability, and okay. I think that's really what this choice came down to. And there's a little lore circulating that having a former Kennedy clerk replace Kennedy uh, was something Kennedy wanted mm-hmm. and uh, that Kennedy had privately told Trump, I'll step down, I'll retire if you replace it with X people. And you know, who knows if that's true or not, but that's, you know, that's out there in the rumor mill. Yeah. Well, I bet Ruth Bader Ginsburg thought Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president. Well, she's 85. So you would expect her to- <laughs> She screwed uh, up. She, she, if she were to retire during Trump's term, which is unlikely that she will, um, you know, that would be- uh, momentous for to say the least mm-hmm. um Breyer, 79 he turns 80 next month so he's not a spring chicken either i think if you still have those two on the court going into the next presidential election it will be another one of those elections where you say oh this election's really about the supreme court right. which raises all kinds of questions like why does the supreme court have this much power why are we voting for yeah. a president based on yeah. what nine lawyers a composition of nine lawyers is that that seems to be odd well, if Trump manages to win re-election in 2020, Gator, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 86 at that point. That, yeah, 86, I mean, not to be indelicate, she yeah. could die. She could, yeah, she um, could. And there's actually no mechanism if 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 a justice were to become 
incapacitated in office or to, you know, be in some sort of vegetative state or something. There's no mechanism for removing that justice short of impeachment. You would have to hmm. actually go and impeach that person who's in ill health. And that would, you know, that would not be seemly, right. but uh, it might be necessary. But she wouldn't step down. She'd just be sick and missing votes and missing arguments and not step down. I mean, there's no way she'd step possible. down with Trump. I don't think she'll step down during Trump. No, I really don't yeah. think she'll step down yeah. during during Trump's tenure. I would be shocked. If well, she did. Kavanaugh spent at least a few days, a few years out of D.C. because he went to Yale. <laughs> so he spent three years in That's presumably right. in New Haven, Connecticut. This just makes me absolutely sick as a libertarian. This Harvard Yale chokehold on the Supreme Court. I think it's exceedingly anti diverse. I think it gives the Northeastern establishment a, a hold on all kinds of policies. And and imagine them talking to us about diversity. You know, it's interesting because the correlation between these Ivy League schools and the politicization of the court have um, mm -hmm. sort of worked in concert. I, I think presidents are trying to pick people that they can't be accused of being unqualified. I think after Harriet Myers, at least, after Harriet Myers, people are saying, well, we need to make sure we pick somebody that uh, is not susceptible right. to accusations of being unqualified. And uh, I, I personally, like you, would, would like to see a lot more diversity. I think there are plenty of really excellent law schools out there and many, many excellent attorneys who went to um, – went to law schools that were not Ivy League. I mean, that's why I think Barrett mm -hmm. Barrett was a Notre Dame law person, and I, I liked that about her. I thought that was a, a unique quality. And then uh, Kethledge and, and, and Hardiman as well were sort of outside that, um, outside that typical cookie-cutter resume, put it that way. Right. I, I guess uh, Hardiman went to Georgetown. I think. Yeah. So by Ivy League standards, that's almost the South or whatever. <laughs> that's yeah. a Southern law school, I guess. That's a, but uh, it, it is interesting also that, you know, so much has been said about his Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And he appears to be a pretty serious Catholic. I think that's and right. and uh, you and I talked about this off air, how the, the Supreme Court was always viewed as this waspy institution. In fact, there were no wasps whatsoever on it for many, many years up until Gorsuch, who is, I guess, raised Catholic, but is now Anglican. Yeah, so, that's correct. So it's not a wasp court, but it's a very Catholic court, or, or, or it will be if if Kavanaugh uh, uh, wins his nomination. Yeah, that, that's true. And one thing that's kind of interesting about that is that, uh, you know, Catholicism has a pretty deep and rich legal theory, tradition of legal theory. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Gorsuch in particular being schooled in, in natural law and studying with John Finnis. Mm -hmm. And lecturing at Notre Dame, and that was one thing that made me actually more comfortable with Gorsuch, um, was that I I felt that his um, his understanding of natural law theory and uh, his commitment to the idea that there is a higher law that is antecedent to government promulgation made him more trustworthy as mm -hmm. as a jurist. Of course, the difference is you are replacing Scalia with with Gorsuch. So that's mm -hmm. almost a while, conservative for conservative. The difference here is that Kennedy is that fulcrum just, justice. He's he's the one that you know could go either way. So replacing him with somebody can change the dynamics of the court altogether. Um, you know, you got Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor, and Kagan on one side, and Roberts, Alito, uh, Thomas, and Gorsuch on the other. And uh, if Kavanaugh fits in on that right side, then you've okay. then you've got a pretty reliable five four majority. For most, um, for most votes, and I think that's what makes the left hysterical about this. This, but nomination. isn't there an inherent conflict here? The left is never going to accept the idea of, of a higher authority or law. Uh, civic nationalists, even on the right, uh, don't really accept that. So, I mean, there's baked in conflict here. The, the secular left simply doesn't think a Supreme Court justice should be influenced by his or her religious views. That's true. Yes. And uh, I think that's another reason why sort of originalism and textualism is a safe methodology for these justices, because then what they're doing in their confirmation hearings is they're discussing their judicial methodology. They're not mm -hmm. results oriented. They deal with the questions as framed when they get them. And they are analyzing statutes as written uh, according to uh, the 
what a what a reasonable mind would have believed the terms to mean at the time the text was adopted. And so that prevents justices from inserting their ideological views into uh, the interpretive process. And I think that maybe isolates some of these conservative nominees from criticism, you would think actually, but mm -hmm. um, but the left the left doesn't doesn't see it that way. Um, and it's interesting, though, if you you recall that um, now we have we have many people on the left that are saying we're all textualists now. I think Scalia sort of changed changed the way judging was done in a lot of ways as far as influence goes. I mean, everybody has to at least account for a textualist or originalist approach, whether they're taking it or not. They have to at least account for it in their appellate decisions. At least federal appellate judges have to do so. So in a sense, there's been a bit of a victory on the right because 30 or 40 years ago, you probably wouldn't have said that. Whereas, In other yeah. words, the, the Federalist Society types have won uh, that point Somewhat, because the left now feels like they have to look to to apply textualism at least as an argument. I think that's right because I think that uh, textualism and originalism. I mean, there are many, many schools of these things, right. and they're pretty rigorous. And you know, there's there's a deep philosophical debate going on among relig uh, originalists. Um, but one thing you're not going to see now is you know Eisenhower nominated uh, Earl Warren and William Brennan. Um, you know, you've got Nixon doing um, uh, Justice Blackman, who who authored the Roe v. Wade opinion. You know, you've got Ford doing John Paul Stevens and uh, H. W. Bush doing Souter, and you're just not going to see that anymore. I mean, this this process of creating a list from which the nominee will be chosen is a new thing. I mean, that's that's sort of a new phenomenon, or at least a public list that's available to everyone for scrutiny. And this allows the general public, in addition to just senators, to give feedback right. on each person. And, uh, and there are lawyers all through the country that can scrutinize opinions or, you know, we're sitting here in the 11th Circuit right now as we speak and say, I practice in the 11th Circuit. Well, I may have some opinion about some justice on the, uh, excuse me, some judge on the 11th Circuit and my dealings with them. And I'm able to tell my senator about about those sorts of things. And so that that sort of transparency, I think, is a good thing. And uh, and you know, it's interesting that we talk about all this from from a libertarian standpoint because I do think, and this is common for everybody, that there's a tendency to look at results as libertarians and we say, okay, you know, is this person pro Obamacare or is they are they pro police or they, but a lot of the the analysis that goes on in a, in a courtroom isn't that. I mean, you're getting a statute and you're having to determine whether the law that's already been enacted through a legislative process comports with the Constitution. And um, and so we we as libertarians sometimes think, oh, right. this is bad. But we, we forget that there is a methodology that the judge is applying. And so the yes. question is, is it, would you rather – given the system we have, would you rather have a judge that has adopted this methodology or – you know, my, my my fear would be that you would have a judge that would adopt some methodology that then someone on the left could use against you. Like say, say mm -hmm. uh, you just want to start talking about rights that are unenumerated, uh, and then you were to institute those rights in an opinion, for example. Well, what happens when the left sees that methodology and says, "Okay, now we're going to have a right to basic subsistence. Now we're going to have a right to a, 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 a minimum income for people. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a right to this and that." And now you've because you because you were trying to be results oriented, you've now opened the door to a results oriented sure, um, sure. approach on the other side. Um, so that's something I'm I'm always uh, would be cautious about. But but I'm not sure the American public buys it. I think yeah. I think most Americans view the Supreme Court as a, a wholly political super legislature, and that it is completely results oriented. And judges have viewpoints and decisions in mind, and then they reverse engineer some legal argument to make the desired result happen. I mean, that is the perception. I personally think as a libertarian, that's healthy. Yeah. That would, we view the court as a political thing, just like I think we should view the Fed as a political thing. But it's it's the the, the rhetoric is that, well, we're bound by precedent and that right. we, have a, we have a methodology. Well, and it's always, of course, it's always skeptical. It's always good to be skeptical of all uh, government uh, institutions. Yeah. Uh, one thing um, I would say to that is that the process of and I, I, there is a, an element of the the Supreme Court becoming a super legislature. I mean, when Marbury v. Madison was handed down, it was one thing to say that oh, it's 
it's the province of the judiciary to say what the law is under the constitutional scheme and and to tell Congress if Congress has done something unconstitutional, mm -hmm. then somebody has to be able to tell Congress that they've done something unconstitutional and that that duty uh, impliedly falls to the judiciary. That's one thing. But what Marbury, Madison, Marbury v. Madison did not contemplate was this idea that the Supreme Court would become this massive super legislature. It was, you know, it was still understood that the Supreme Court wasn't making law. It wasn't legislating. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened with the Supreme Court over, over the years. And I do think from Rehnquist on, the court has scaled back on that. And some of the, the movement toward originalism and textualism that we talked about that even judges on the left have to account for has, has sort of scaled that back. But, uh, but now we have an out of control administrative state that, uh, that justices have to deal with. I mean, you've got uh, executive agencies that are created by the legislature, but they exercise these quasi legislative functions. And then Congress, you know, delegates the powers to these agencies, mm -hmm. and then that that gets rid of their accountability. Then they can just yell and shout about agencies, and they can blame all these things on the agencies, like I, I hate the EPA, I hate that. But they're the ones that delegated the powers to them, and they can take them away. But but then if it becomes their right. responsibility, then they're the ones to blame, and they have to go tell their constituents. So for in some ways, it's convenient for the politicians to be able to blame agencies. So there's an incentive structure in there for politicians not to go after agencies because, you know, they don't want the they don't want to take the responsibilities that you know they don't want Congress to have these responsibilities that they've delegated to agencies. So that's a that's a dynamic that's got to get worked out, and um, if it's not too late. But you know, one thing that's telling about Marbury versus Madison judicial review is you'll you'll hear the public and even journalists say. Such and such case is the law of the land. That's right. Yeah. You hear that all the time. And the, you see the supremacy clause cited uh, erroneously a lot because the yeah. supremacy clause says, you know, federal laws that that are actually consistent with the Constitution are, you know, the law of the land. So, um, you know, if you created some some federal law you know, that that was just obviously unconstitutional. Well, the court can strike that down, and it's it's not going to be the the law of the land. Um, so you know there there are a lot of you're, you're right. There there's yeah. a lot of issues with with stare decisis with precedent. I think part of the problem is the incorporation of you know the ancient uh, English common law into an American system of federalism with fifty states and trying to figure out what it means to have this um, sort of horizontal um, binding stare decisis versus, you know, what what does it mean to have federalism and what what role are the state's going to play versus the federal government? You've got these, these uh, federal courts and these state courts, these federal courts all created by statute with the exception of the Supreme Court, which is which is constitutional. Um, and then you've got all these state courts. And what what is the interplay supposed to look like? How are these circuits supposed to deal with uh, state Supreme Court decisions? And the Constitution doesn't give you clear answers to that. So we've been trying to work that out ever since the founding, and it's been messy. And that's not a system that lends itself to sort of the traditional ancient understanding of the common law as customary and bottom up. I mean, in a system where you've got mm -hmm. a top down Constitution that establishes the framework in which all law has to operate, that's very different from a system of custom that comes from time immemorial, time out of mind that just exists and that judges locally have to respond to and that you can't really understand. So, I mean, the common law is you're, you're going to different areas mm -hmm. of the realm and determining what mm -hmm. laws do these different regions have in common and uh, and and how are judges getting that from you know jury decisions? Yeah, and the, and root, the root is the same as commoners. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a good point. It emanating from the people rather than from from the top but, down. Uh, you know, I just want to get back to this originalism and textualism. I, let, let's make an important point here: is that a huge percent of the country is just not buying this because the whole idea that we should look at the original intent of either the founders mm -hmm. or whoever drafted uh, a federal uh, piece of legislation who was in Congress at the time. A lot of people say, why should we be bound by these old, dead, white guy founders, property owners, slaveholders, et cetera? We hear this ad nauseum. Or why should we even be bound by a bunch of dead congressmen from the 1930s? In other words, 
I'll, I'll just say generically, the left doesn't buy it and the right uses it, I think, in hypocritical ways. In other words, they use textualism when it serves their purposes. So, yeah, to give an example, maybe you would look at like a Fourth Amendment case and you would say, OK, the framers clearly could not have contemplated – we'll use the the Clayman, the Clayman case that, that I thought um, um, Kavanaugh had a bad – a very bad line on which is where he said, in my view, I think that you know this is um, uh, this meta government's metadata collection program mm -hmm. is entirely consistent with the Fourth Amendment. Well, you you pick up the Fourth Amendment, and you read the Fourth Amendment, and you're like, well, I, how is this consistent with the Fourth Amendment? I mean, that right. like uh, on its face, the framers never would have contemplated an iPhone. How do you deal with that? Well, people like Rehnquist would say, okay, the principles are what are perennial. They're right. what that what sort of get repurposed over time in light of changed circumstances and new technologies and these kinds of things. But the principles are the same and you just apply them to new facts um, so that you're not doing the living constitution thing. Okay. You're, that That's sort of the, maybe the Rehnquist response to that. But uh, I think with, uh, with Kavanaugh in that particular case, I just want to throw this out there is I, I, I think he's wrong in that case because I mean, he's assuming that you would have no reasonable expectation of privacy in your, and the metadata in your cell phone, which right. no one knew government was collecting at the time anyway. And then you would think that it, 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 if the government were to say, oh, this is this is reasonable for us, that they, they would at least be able to show that the collection stopped some right. kind of imminent right. attack or threat. And they, they, if they can't show that, then it seems especially unreasonable. So that was the case that I think people were worried maybe Rand Paul wouldn't, wouldn't vote yay. Mm -hmm. And um, – and and that's a valid that's a valid concern, and it's one that I have with 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 Kavanaugh myself. Congressman Justin Amash has actually been tweeting about Kavanaugh's yeah. bad Fourth Amendment decisions. Obviously, Amash won't vote on the nomination, but right. uh, you know, and there's kind of two questions with respect to the the cell phone metadata issue you raise, and that apparently Kavanaugh's bad on. One is is whether metadata vacuuming after the fact is okay and comports with the Fourth Amendment, or a different analysis is whether the Fourth Amendment even applies mm -hmm. to this NSA activity. So, are two separate questions. Yeah, and I mean the four, the Fourth Amendment was designed to prevent arbitrary government interference into the private affairs of individuals, and it, it, to to show you, the government would have to show that this is is not an arbitrary thing, and to do that, they'd have to mm -hmm. say, well, it's not arbitrary because we're we're trying to prevent terrorist attacks or whatever we're doing. But if they can't even show that, then it sure seems arbitrary. If they can't show that there's actually any kind of causality, oh, yes, doing this, in fact, has stopped X, Y, and Z, and they can't do that, then it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary collect collection. So, Have you seen much to form an opinion about Kavanaugh on what we would call economic liberty? I, 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 I think he's okay with the Obamacare mandate, for example. Well, the, the Obamacare mandate is... Um, that's a different issue. So that's the that's the Seven Sky case, and there's some debate over whether he created a framework under the individual mandates penalty mm -hmm. to treat it as a tax mm -hmm. that would have enabled you know, someone like John Roberts in 2012 to to borrow from that scheme. Um, so what he did in that case is he was he actually said I didn't think I don't think the court should have jurisdiction here because of the Anti Injunction Act, which barred courts. Um, from ruling on tax issues before they took effect. And he's saying, well, this okay. penalty hasn't taken effect yet. So we don't have jurisdiction to rule on it. But in writing about this issue, he said uh, basically that the scheme of the penalty, because it uh, requires the assessment and collection according to – like as, as a tax would be assessed and collected, then it, it is in effect a tax. It is like a tax. And that sure. that did create you know, something for John Roberts to work with. So it, it is entirely reasonable to conclude that Kavanaugh created a, a framework that Roberts could have borrowed from or at least considered – and upholding uh, the individual mandate as as a right. uh, as a tax and 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 uh, not a penalty. So, um, so yeah, that's that that's that's another glaring case that I, I that bothers me about Kavanaugh. There's the Clayman, 
There's a uh, seven sky. Um, now there is some evidence that he's good on, uh, administrative agencies. The okay. white house is touting him as having overturned like 75 regulations from administrative agencies. Okay. He's attacked the EPA on cases and uh, in particular in areas regarding emissions regulation, uh, state air pollution rules, greenhouse gas regulations. So, you know, he, he is a, he is doing stuff to push back against yeah. uh, the growth of administrative yeah. agencies. He's got a case in, in Heller where he's um, appears to be protective of Second Amendment rights. Um, but as far as economic liberty as a concept, I, you don't see much – you don't really see much or overarching philosophical discussion by Kavanaugh. So unlike Gorsuch, where you, you might get some philosophical discussion, so Gorsuch may have some kind of conversation about natural law or whatever. Well – Kavanaugh is going to have some kind of conversation about a procedural technicality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or um, an issue of statutory interpretation. You know, that's that's his world. He's he's sort of a a, a scholar of procedure and okay. forms versus Gorsuch, who's much more of a philosophical, deeper thinker. Someone that's going to look at a tradition. I mean, Gorsuch is going to. Go look and see what Locke and Montesquieu and Cook and Blackstone <laughs> and all these people yeah. thought about things. And uh, Kavanaugh is much more likely to look and see, well, what did the last judge say in the last case and the last opinion and what's precedent and what's going to bind me in that that So process. he's sort of a real nuts and bolts federal appellate lawyer. But I think, I think it, it right. probably speaks to his competence and his importance that some of his theories and ideas have gone upstream and been considered that's true. by a Rehnquist or somebody at the Supreme Court, excuse me, by a Roberts or somebody Roberts, at the right. Supreme Court. So, so it's usually the other way around. Yeah, there have been – the Supreme Court has adopted some of his opinions and, and sort of validated his legal reasoning. And he's mm -hmm. on the D.C. Circuit, which is considered sort of the stepping stone of the Supreme Court. And uh, cases from the D.C. Circuit often end up at the Supreme Court. So his analysis is uh, is more likely than most judges to be considered by uh, Supreme Court justices. And I think people generally agree that he is a very smart person. He's a very intelligent person. Mm -hmm. um, so it's worth going and look, looking at what he said and how he analyzed it just to see whether you disagree or not. If Kavanaugh is written on the issue, you, you're going to want to see what he said. So he said some mealy mouth things about Roe v. Wade. As a libertarian, Roe v. Wade doesn't excite me one way or the other. I, I think it's wrongly decided. I think there's nothing about abortion in the Constitution. It ought to be up to the states. And, and we were discussing this earlier. There's no reason why uh, certain states couldn't be more liberal with abortion under a, under a pre-Roe framework. But, but nonetheless, he said some mealy mouth things. What does he do as a Catholic who, who presumably thinks abortion's wrong? What does he do? He, he he mumbles about precedent. Yeah, I think that's what he does, and uh, that's respecting what he, precedent. And that's what he did in his in 2006 confirmation hearing. He said basically, I think Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and we don't upset precedent. But again, he was a, a, a lower appellate court judge. He wasn't going up for confirmation on the high court. Um, I don't know that it matters exactly how he treats this. I mean. He's just going to say, probably, I can't discuss it because this matter might come before me on the court. And that's basically a punt. And that's probably what he's going to have to do. Is, is but it's not going to come before him, is it? They're not going to do anything to Roe v. Wade. Well, and it's it's actually interesting because everyone talks about like overturning Roe v. Wade. Well, that's an, almost not the way case precedents typically change. I mean, if you look at Casey and, and mm -hmm. Carhartt, I mean, these are – these are adaptations to Roe v. Wade. I mean, when Roe's going to look at in, as this balancing test where you're going to balance the state interests and health and um, the woman's health and all this stuff, and you, they versus versus the uh, uh, um, the interest in a, a woman's privacy, and then you're going to establish this balancing test that incorporates this third trimester framework. Well, then later on, you know, the court gets rid of that third trimester framework, and it's just a gradual process. So. The, the likelihood that the court's going to take up a case and just say we hereby overrule Roe v. Wade is, is really unlikely. I mean litigants have to frame the question the right way, bring it up through the appellate process mm -hmm. and the right process and get the constitutional question exactly right. And it's just unlikely for fact patterns out there in the real world to actually fit that. So – if Roe v. Wade goes away, it'll probably be eventual, uh, eventual process 
by a series of decisions rather than one case that just says we hereby overrule Roe v. Wade. Um, right. So I, I, you know, the left probably is right to be concerned that they're that mm-hmm. that the, the Roe v. Wade is jeopardized, um, and the right is probably right to be thrilled that that Roe v. Wade uh, might eventually be jeopardized. But for Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings, I don't see it making a difference because. You know, I, I have a feeling that Republicans are going to be able to get him through in light of the nuclear option. They're going to be able to get him through. I don't think you're going to see many uh, senators. Um, I don't think you'll see really probably any defecting. And you're going to have people like Joe Manchin, who's running against yeah. Patrick Morrissey, the popular AG that's a big Republican. And, you know, he can't he's, – he's got to – he's got to vote. Uh, for Kavanaugh. And, and Kavanaugh's not seen as some rabid pro-lifer that Murkowski or Susan Collins have to defend against with their own voters. No, I, mean, I think he totally satisfies uh, he's Collins not Murkowski. Bork. He's not Robert Bork. No, he, that's right. He, he may pull <laughs> votes from Joe Donnelly. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what Doug Jones and here in Alabama, what he's going to do. I I mean, if he, if he wants to have yes. any shot whatsoever in keeping his office... He's got to vote yes because well he's been on I think Fox intimating that he would consider voting yes I think he's saying I'll keep him open yeah. mind and all that which I mean, yeah. what else would yeah. you expect him to say he's yeah. got to say that but uh, you know there there's some question marks out there Claire McCaskill Missouri John Tester Montana mm-hmm. I think they they both voted against Gorsuch but primarily because I think they realized okay Republicans are going to get it nuclear option we'll we'll just we'll vote this way just to uh, right. appeal to our party base. And uh, and that's also but, a couple years before their election, right? An election year is different. An election year is different, which is why people like Joe Manson are, <laughs> are sort of on the hot seat. So. Well, but I, the thing about abortion is, I think it's a great list, litmus test for libertarians. This is an aside, not not on the issue itself, whether you're pro or against abortion, but rather how it's handled. In other words, from my perspective, we, we can't have one abortion rule for top down for 320 million people. Mm-hmm. in a country as diverse as ours. And I think it ought to be localized as much as possible. I would like to see common law, as you discussed earlier, common custom and practice and locality governed. But a lot of libertarians who are very strongly pro-choice say, you know, are, are pro-federalization, pro-nationalization and say, no, we need an overarching federal law that says abortion's legal. And that that is the libertarian take on this, because if not, you'd have these regressive states like Alabama trying to radically restrict abortion. Um, I, I think that's the wrong libertarian answer. I think the right libertarian answer is that, uh, and and again, I, I'm not personally animated by the pro-life or pro-choice side, but I think the right libertarian answer is that it, it should be decentralized, and you should you should live with the fact that other people see these intractable social issues differently than you do. Well, there there are. Competing schools, in my view, but among libertarian uh, jurisprudence, I don't like when – and I said jurisprudence, not not jurisprudence. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I don't like people trying to come forth and say this is this is what a libertarian jurisprudence is. This is it. We figured it out because in my view, there is a, 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 a difference. And conceptually, there's one concept that says, OK, we ought to – uh, have a centralized, robust federal judiciary to ensure that all the states come into compliance and and protect individual liberty. And then there's another methodology that says, look, we need to have decentralization, diffusion of power, dispersal of power. We need to have diversity of jurisdictions, and uh, and that's more along the lines of where I fall. So I'm I'm more of a thinker that that is uh, you know I'm 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 I'm. Hayekian in that sense. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of with like, I'm sort of conservative in that sense. I can see myself coming out of a, 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 a Michael Oakeshott tradition. And, uh, and I like to see some competition between jurisdictions and, and letting people decide in their own personal communities what works and operates. I like the bottom up process. I like, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I like the messiness and the checks and the balances and uh, the separation of powers, I don't think it's a good thing to centralize and nationalize power and then dictate to faraway places what ought to be the libertarian right. viewpoint. And, and the flip side of that is if if you demand an overarching federal law, what if the right comes in and makes an overarching federal law banning abortion? In other words, yeah. you're, you're opening yourself up to, to executive or in this case, judicial power. I want to finish up with, with a, a little bit more about Kavanaugh, the guy. 
uh, Ryan McMakin wrote a great article about a week or so ago on Mises.org about how the Supreme Court is way, way, way too powerful. And one thing he mentions, he mentions this about Hillary Clinton in, in other contexts, but that so many of these old Supreme Court justices are completely removed from ordinary life. They don't really they haven't had a real job for decades. They don't really do normal things. They don't mow lawns. They don't go to normal places that they're really in a bubble because they've been appellate judges at the federal level for so long. Now they're a Supreme Court justice and that it's dangerous to have these people so detached, nine people, I might add, mm -hmm. so detached from the 320 million people for whom they hold, over whom they hold this great power. And Kavanaugh seems to be bucking that a little bit with his image. He's got this, he's got the beer drinking allegations. <laughs> uh, he, he has Nats tickets that he apparently bought with credit cards. He, he seems like a, a kind of a normal guy. I wonder if he'll play to that. That's a good question. I think Gorsuch tried to play as the, as, as the normal guy too. He tried to say, look, I'm a hunter, fisher, outdoorsman, that kind of but thing. But also a PhD. And, but also yeah, academic. Exactly. Brilliant guy. I, is Kavanaugh brilliant? Because I think Gorsuch is, love him or hate him, is legit brilliant. I think I, I agree with you on Gorsuch. I think Kavanaugh is a very smart guy, but he is less of a historian and a philosopher okay. and more of just a, a great lawyer. So he, he is brilliant too, but he put his brilliant mind to, into being a lawyer and poured it into that, whereas Gorsuch was more exploratory and, and tried to think outside the box and as an academic would follow questions – where they might lead and 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 uh, and be more of an open-minded person and be interested in the big questions and uh, sort of the perennial themes that pop up in all generations. Whereas Kavanaugh's much more narrow, mm -hmm. lawyerly type. But not to put too fine a distinction. I mean, he seems kind of normal in the sense he doesn't look his physical appearance. Yeah. What he what he sort of does in his spare time. You know, Souter had that really intellectual kind of almost a daininess to him sure. that is very off putting. I think to a lot of people. Yep. Uh, not not to denigrate Souter. I'm sure he's a brilliant guy. Yeah. But but Kavanaugh has got kind of not a blue collar vibe to him, but a, a, an ordinary. Vibe. He's, he's your guy next door. He's got two young kids. He's 53. He likes sports. He he's runs 53. 53 runs up credit card debt. <laughs> Anywhere between sixty and one hundred twenty thousand dollars, depending on on well, what you well, that's, read. That's and, a, that's a, uh, increasingly normal in America. Yeah. Well, I was I was shocked when I saw that, but uh, I didn't I didn't know how I didn't I didn't realize that that was normal. So maybe but, he's a complete idiot in his personal life. I mean, how do you <laughs> run up sixty so. to um, over three cards? I think three cards. Well, we're out of time, but uh, it's always great talking to you. And it's you know, great being here. if there's another Supreme Court vacancy. I know uh, Amy Barrett didn't make the cut, but there's another Notre Dame grad yes. uh, named Andrew Napolitano, Napolitano, I think would be an absolute great fit. And of course, his Freedom Watch show is rumored to be returning to, I believe, Fox Business. I'm not sure if it's Fox regular or Fox Business. So we'll look forward to that. And we'll look forward to having Alan Mendenhall back very soon. Thanks so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Have an excellent weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.